Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'm going to be talking about my experience in arguing with atheists, because I had referenced this in a previous video saying why I don't debate atheists, and I had mentioned a big part of it is how I've done it a lot. Um, but one of the mistakes human beings are very prone to is we tend to assume that everybody is just like us. This is the downfall of a lot of political theories, by the way, but that, that's beside the point. Um, and, and the really funny thing about this, because it's obviously not true, we're obviously, you know, all fairly different, but, I mean, with, with great similarities, of course. But the thing is, we'll even do this about experience. And that's obviously silly, because we've all lived different lives, and so we're not going to all have the same experiences. And yet, it's a problem that I and others have, we kind of just assume unconsciously that everyone does. And so, in, you know, in this particular case, when I made reference to my long experience of debating atheists and how they sort of never come up with anything new, I was kind of taking it for granted that everyone knew what they do in fact come up with. And, you know, it, there's that mistake. So, for the benefit of, of those of you who have not done a tremendous amount of arguing with atheists, I, I have, I've never really done like a formal debate thing, you know, with moderators and timekeepers and whatnot, because that's a form of public entertainment. That doesn't help the, you know, the argument at hand. That, that's just there to make sure that the audience doesn't get bored, basically. Um, so I'm going to go over, you know, the basics of how these arguments tend to go. Um, for the benefit of those of you who haven't been in them all the time. Now, now this is primarily addressed to, to Christians. Um, you know, anyone on the theist side. Although theist just means non-atheist. I don't know. Anyway, point is, um, that's the intended audience here. I, I strongly doubt that an atheist would get anything out of this video. But, hey, you never know, whatever. Okay, so, um, generally speaking, th there's, there's one of two ways that these arguments te will tend to go. Uh, probably the more common, and usually often the first too, if a person goes for both, is they start out with unmeetable evidentiary standards. So like for example, they'll only accept as true something that shows up in peer-reviewed scientific papers. Uh, of course this is absolutely silly as a you know general criteria for acknowledging something as true. Um, I mean the easiest way, it, it, my friend Yves Kanan loves to um, use the principle of retortion, applying a principle to itself. And, you know, a lot of things just sort of immediately fail by that principle. Things that are universal. Non-universals this doesn't apply to because they often don't apply to, you know, they're not supposed to apply to themselves. But here, if you'll only accept things in scientific peer-reviewed papers, you could even do the very silly thing of, well, can you prove to me that this peer-reviewed scientific paper that you have was in fact a peer-reviewed scientific paper. Where is the peer-reviewed scientific paper stating that this paper was a peer-reviewed scientific paper? You get an immediate infinite regress. It's obviously not applicable. I mean, if you're just a human being, you'll kind of have the experience that most of life and most of what we know to be true does not show up in peer-reviewed scientific papers. What's that person's name? There will be no scientific peer-reviewed paper to tell you. Okay, uh, you'll get things like history is completely unreliable. Um, in general, you know, if it's something documented in history, you'll get like, well, yeah, but, you know, people lied, you can never be sure. Um, yeah, it, it, however, they will believe the history they want to believe, um, again, but, you know, some form of that, where, where all history simply isn't knowledge. Okay, um, then, you know, uh, another one of them will be They'll only accept reproducible experiments. Th this will, of course, obviously rule out history. It'll also, you know, rule out scientific peer-reviewed papers because the paper is not itself a, an experiment. The paper's describing an experiment. Um, but, uh, again, most of life is not, you know, suitable to... You, you know, most of life is not, you know, accessible by empirical evidence. Do, you know, does your girlfriend love you? Do your parents love you? Um... You know, those are things for which you cannot produce any empirical evidence. You can infer things from evidence, but inference is not empirical evidence. This is actually one of the funny things. Most of science is not you know, sustained by direct empirical observation. It, it's got empirical observation as sort of a base layer and then reasoned inference on top of that. But they will explicitly deny reasoned inference. They want explicit reproducible, uh, I'm sorry, explicit empirical evidence. Um, of things which 
if you're ruling out, you know, rational inference, there's very, very little for which a person has empirical evidence for. Um, another criteria that you'll find is only what is universally acknowledged to be true can be true. So, you know, some form of, like, if some such and such were the case, then everybody would already know it. Um, I, I've even seen this one as in, uh, it's, it's one argument St. Thomas didn't, didn't mention in the arguments against God's existence, the argument from the existence of atheists, that if um, God existed, there'd be no such thing as an atheist, so therefore God doesn't exist because atheists do. It's a fun argument. Um, but um, again, there's nothing which is universally acknowledged to be true. So um, what tends to happen here is, you know, when challenged, it will be some form of, well, they're the people who count, which will be domain specific, but it's, you know, essentially everybody for when it comes to whether or not God exists, things like that. Um, I, I'm talking uh, not just about, you know, God's existence, but Christianity generally, I'm, I'm drawing these things from. Okay, uh, another one I've seen is that the, the, only, um, the only records that count are praise from enemies or criticism from friends. Because, you know, your friends might praise you, but, you know, of course friends will just do that, so you can't believe that. And enemies will criticize you, but of course you can't believe the enemies, because you can never trust anyone to be fair. But you can reasonably trust criticism from a friend or praise from an enemy. Um, now the thing about all of these, and I've given some, you know, illustrations, but they're completely not, they are not appliable to the totality of life. And if you try, they become silly. And they're always stated as generalities. Um, so what's actually kind of fun here, um, if you're dealing with somebody you actually interact with a fair amount, is to actually adopt these standards for a little while. And every time they tell you about something, question it on the basis of whatever they have used to question, you know, history or so on. So like, you know, can you prove that the magazine article really said that? Or, um, you know, only the people who believe that the, the CERN particle accelerator exists have written about the CERN particle accelerator. Find me the reports of the CERN particle accelerator from people who don't believe that it exists. Things like that. Um, don't do it for very long because people will get really annoyed at you. Um, and the funny thing is they also won't take it as any sort of indication that if people actually take them seriously, they hate it. Um, anyway. The other thing you will see um, a lot, so that, that's sort of one collection of approaches, that's one family of approaches. The other family of approaches is generally some form of saying that knowledge is impossible. Um, as soon as this is challenged, it tends to be retrenched to certainty is impossible. Um, but the thing is, the, the sort of certainty, typically speaking, that they will initially describe here is utterly impossible, because by certainty they tend to mean something that convinces you to such a degree that it is impossible for you to not believe it no matter how hard you try. That doesn't exist, it can't exist. Um, so, um, usually though, if you challenge that, it will get re retrenched again into, like, merely an unimaginably high evidentiary standard, but, but not literally an impossible to meet one, like something that literally forces you to believe something. Um, so, uh, the, another version of this um, will be things like, we don't know if the laws of logic are true, they're just observations we have. Um, we don't know if causation is, is actually true. Um, and, and then, you know, both of these you'll see uh, counterexample cited in quantum mechanics. Um, now, now there are several things to say about quantum mechanics, one of which is that quantum mechanics tends to be quite a rabbit hole. There's, there's some utterly fascinating experiments. Quantum mechanics makes very interesting reading, especially the experimental side. Um, now one of the curious things is you'll actually meet more than a few physicists who basically tell you that the quantum mechanics consists entirely of the equations and doesn't really mean anything past that that all attempts to give it a meaning are essentially an anthropomorphization uh, of the equations. That's not a universal uh, by any means, but I've seen that a fair amount. Um, another thing is that there's a lot in quantum mechanics which is, has competing interpretations. Um, so there's one interpretation a person can appeal to, but that's just one interpretation of what's been observed, and by no means, you know, that, that's not knowledge of what quantum mechanics even is in terms of, you know, what the scientific evidence shows. Um, so, um, you know, like, like for causation, you, know, you, you get, um, uh, well, actually, I'm sorry, for causation, a counterexample, like I saw recently, I've seen a bunch of times, um, is, uh, atomic decay. 
that, that apparently the atom decays with, with no cause to it. And now here we run into a problem that causation is very often mistaken to be external causation. That is to say that um, it's causation like, like on a billiard table, that the thing that causes one billiard ball to move is another billiard ball smacking into it. And so if you can't find that first billiard ball, this is a violation of causality. Um, when in fact it's just finding that there isn't that sort of cause involved. Um, yeah, I, I don't... It, I, I, this would take a long time to explain in detail. Hopefully you, you know sort of at least some of what I mean here. Um, the, uh, relatedly too, you'll also find, you know, when, when you point out that like, well, that's one interpretation, but, you know, another interpretation is that, you know, the electron, you know, whatever the particle is, has free will and it just decides on its own at some point to do something. There's, there's no evidence that, that contradicts the idea of subatomic particles having free will and making their own decisions. Um, there, there isn't particularly good evidence for it other than that they don't obey that sort of billiard ball style causation. But um, having said that, I'm just saying, I, I'm not saying this is the case. I am saying there isn't evidence to exclude this being the case. And um, what will then happen, you know, when you pr present alternate explanation, you know, interpretations that also fit the facts, is they will then essentially say, well, you can't know that my preferred interpretation that violates, you know, whatever it is they want to violate, you know, isn't true, is in my experience where they tend to go at that point. And it's true, we can't know, but because they're the ones providing a counterexample to the, you know, things like the laws of logic or, you know, causation, um, it, it, it's very, very weak to say that, like, to, that, that human thinking doesn't work and your evidence for it is that you can't rule out a particular interpretation of certain phenomena. On the other hand, you know, that convinces them, it convinces them. Okay. Um, you also get things like, you know, ex nihilo nihil fit, from nothing comes nothing, uh, is just an observation. Maybe stuff comes out of nothing. Well, you can't say all the time because then we'd be, obser be observing it constantly, but maybe it comes out whenever it wants. What, what the limiting factor on it, given that it's nothing, and therefore there can be no limits, is I, I have no idea. But anyway, um, I, I'm just giving an outline of where these things go. I'm not trying to argue it all out. Um, and and in general, as I um, as I said with quantum mechanics, it tends to be when you point out that their counterexamples to basic rationality and, and knowledge aren't actually counterexamples to it. Um, they, they tend to just essentially say, yeah, but you can't know that they're not. You know, that there isn't some counterexample to it somewhere. Uh, um, so, now the thing about both of these is that they will tend to feel a lot like wrestling a greased eel. Um, be, because the person will never stay on one position for too long. They'll always be jumping around between these things. Because if they ever stuck with one, you'll then point out how this vitiates pretty much all of how they live their life. Or contradicts um, much of how they live their life. And... That wouldn't work so well. So every time you're getting close to pointing this out, they'll tend to jump to something else. Um, these conversations are tremendously like that. Worse, um, since most people aren't good at clearly defining their terms, there will tend to be a great deal of verbal ambiguity. So the things I'm describing are after you have spent a long time tracking down exactly in agreeing to particular definitions of words, and then reminding people of the definitions of the words they've agreed to, um, which you often have to do as well. Um, so after you've done all of the arguing over the definitions of words, which will probably take up actually most of your discussion, this stuff is what you finally get to once meanings have become clear. Um, and, and the reason why it feels like wrestling with a greased eel is that in an argument like this, you know, which you can loosely call informal debate, or, you know, also in a formal debate, the point is to get the other person to acknowledge something is true. By and large, that's not actually doable. It, 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 for some people, in some cases, particularly honest, particularly honorable people who are very quick-witted, um, you can actually, if they are wrong and you are right and it is, you know, really provable, you can sometimes get people to admit that they are wrong. It's very rare. Most of the time what happens is you've convinced some, the most you can do is convince somebody that a particular line of argumentation for their side doesn't work and they're not sure why it doesn't work and they're not sure what then is the better form of argumentation for their side. So typically the best case scenario 
will be for somebody to abandon a line of argumentation with you and go to try and f try to find something else. And that, that that's a best case scenario. Because the thing is, you can't make people believe in things. The, the, you can't believe in something by an act of will, but you can disbelieve in something by an act of will. And you can, even more to the point, direct the intellect so that it is looking at things or not looking at things. Um, and one of the things you find is, it is true that if somebody doesn't want to believe in something, they will have arguments, but the arguments don't matter very much. Now, having said that, it is also the case that this is a super easy thing to say. It's very, very easy to charge somebody with, oh, well, all your arguments are just rationalizations. You're just trying to give, um, you know, some sort of decoration to, you know, the fact that you're just believing something because you want to. Incredibly easy to charge somebody with being disingenuous. But the fact that it's easy to charge somebody with being disingenuous, and it happens way too often in this world, doesn't mean that people, in fact, are all genuine. They're just not always. Um, so there's that. There's also on a deeper level um, that uh, for, for really big things, for really, really big things, like does reason work? Is the universe really intelligible? Does God exist? Things of this sort of nature, the really, really big questions. People believe these for very large collections of reasons, most of which they don't know how to state, most of which are experiences. Uh, most of which are experiences they've never, you know, thought about in, like, a formal sense. They are experiences that they have integrated into their body of knowledge in the informal way that we do with almost all the knowledge that we hold. And so the fact that, that a person will not be easily swayed given that there are, you know, tens of thousands of hours of life experience that have brought them to some conclusion, that you can't sway them from that in, you know, six hours of, of arguing with them, is not, it should not be very surprising. Um, and it's not that human beings are irrational, but rather that most of, of our reasoning is not done in a formally linguistic sense. Um, so that there's, there's all this mass of evidence of various kinds, and things like, you know, what have people who believe different things been like are part of them. And, you know, what are the good things that they've seen, what do those good things depend on as being true? Because, you know, when a person has experienced goodness, and whether this is ice cream being delicious, or roller coasters being fun, or a sunset being beautiful, or they really love being hugged by their parents, or whatever, you know, the particulars are for each person, those things they have seen as good are the most certain things that they know. They will, therefore, defend these things pretty much to the death, because these are the greatest points of certainty for them in this world. Well, one reason, incidentally, why it's very important when arguing with people to always be precise and always be careful and never ever accidentally deny something that is true and always show respect to things that are true because another person may see them much much more clearly than you do and if you seem to not be seeing that they will assume you are definitely wrong because you don't see one of the few things they do actually know for sure are true um so that's the thing like you you don't get directly at these deeper things that are arrived at through you know, thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of hours of having been a human being living where each second, you know, you experience things and all of these get put together. You don't change all that in a few hours with an argument. That That's not how human beings work because um, we, we just, we think primarily on a different level. Not an irrational level, necessarily, but we think on a much deeper level because the details of life actually do matter. Arguments are always in summary form and living life is actually in detailed form. And the summary does not just immediately trump the details. Um, the, the summary is very useful, the summary does things, but um, despite the fact that we really like summaries because they're easier and shorter and more convenient, most of life is lived in the details. And so it is proper that people give respect to that mass of details that a small summary you know, is not equal to, especially in the short term. Um, however, arguments are very useful for stripping away armor, um, for getting people to, you know, because there'll be particular stumbling blocks that people have. You know, there'll be armor on top of particular misconceptions and so on. Arguments can strip away the armor, they can remove stumbling blocks. In some cases, there'll be something, you know, nailing a person's sneakers to the ground, and you can pry up one of those nails. They're going to have to do the walking, but you 
argumentation can do these things. It can bring a person much closer to a position of uncertainty, of agnosticism, of you know proper skepticism, where they become skeptical of their own conclusions. Um, so argumentation is by no means useless. It's just not the entirety of life. Um, now, I, I should note, by the way, that, that the various things I've described is, are not going to be the atheist subjective experience of what has happened. They don't, they don't feel like they were a greased eel. They feel like you didn't understand what they were saying. They feel like you didn't have any good arguments that really addressed their points. If, if they're particularly generous, they may think that this is partially because they didn't explain their points very well. Um, if they're particularly generous. If they're not, um, in general, they'll simply blame you for not having understood anything they were saying, for not having gotten their arguments, and the things that you said will not really make any sense because you're just, you know, flying off on wild flights of fancy into stupid things like, you know, who cares that there's some people who don't think that we exist. So, so their subjective experience will be very, very different. Um, and th this is why it's almost impossible to win a debate, by the way. Um, that a, a person who, um, a person who, ha, you know, th their underlying thing has not been uncovered, they're not really dealing with that, the, the underlying, you know, body of evidence, is somebody who is going to see you as not having addressed that, and the fact that you may not have stated it very well doesn't really matter, but what was foremost on their mind is that. That is real to them. We just kind of, you know, being outside their minds, we infer that it exists because they are human and probably therefore like us in that regard, that they have lived a fairly long time and therefore learned something from it. Um, but we don't, you know, their body of knowledge is not real to us, so we don't feel it. It's very real to them, and it will not have been directly addressed, and they will feel like it has not been directly addressed. Um, so, so they'll have an extremely different subjective experience than what I am describing for extremely natural reasons. So... Um, having said all that, I just want to add sort of my approach, um, after many, many, many years of arguing, has changed a fair amount. Um, I, I'm not saying this is the right approach or the approach everyone should be using or, or anything like that. I'm just saying what I am trying right now, and this is in real life. Online, I, I don't see much of any point in, in arguing with, with um, atheists. I'm on the wrong team. I'm an outsider. I'm, you know, I'm in the out group to them. And uh, especially a lot of them... Um, you know, when they see something they don't understand, there are two possibilities for, for you know, an argument they don't understand. And, and if you spend any time in comment sections on Twitter, they, they don't understand pretty much everything. Um, there are some exceptions, but, but th there are a lot of people who understand approximately nothing, you know, on the internet. Th this should not be shocking to anyone. Um, and, you know, and these people I'm, I'm talking about primarily uh, here. Um, you know, either the person whose argument they don't understand is much smarter than they are, or much dumber than they are, and the fact that this person is in the out group, you know, is, is wrong about the fundamental thing. They're they're different. They're other. Means they're almost certainly an idiot. And and this is a heuristic that almost all human beings use. Um, this is why reputation matters so much. It's not not something available on the internet. So I, I'm not saying to blame these people. Um, you know, the the the, the uh, you know like, like the person who shows up and. Um, you know, tells me that my argument uh, is, is about a God of the Gaps argument when it was nothing of the kind. I don't blame them for not understanding it. Um, and I further don't blame them for not assuming that I must have had a good argument that they just didn't get because, you know, I'm one of those peop those other people. I'm one of the dumb people. I'm one of the people who's just catastrophically wrong about basic things to them. And so... It's just natural to assume, like, why would they assume that I actually have a good point, given that clearly I'm not good at coming to correct conclusions anyway? It's a heuristic, um, and I think it's a, you know, they apply it generally as a heuristic, so it's not, you know, completely unreasonable. But in real life, we get to know people. People build up reputations. We know that somebody is smart, even though the argument they're making doesn't really make a lot of sense to us, so presumably there is, in fact, something there. So we'll talk to them more about it later something like that. In real life, we have those relationships on, on which dis, you know, real discourse can be built. Um, you know, often over a very long time, but you know, we have them. And so my approach there is to give truth that helps to understand the world as it is. So if somebody's you know, wrestling with um, you know, difficulties of like, how do you deal with human beings? Um, you know, like so many people are awful. Like, how do you not lose your faith in humanity? 
and explaining to them, actually, it's very important that you lose your faith in humanity, because humanity should not have faith placed in it. Human beings are awful. The whole trick of life is to love people despite the fact that they're awful. Because if you only love people because they're good, and they're not, they're not, um, they're not completely depraved or anything like that, mind you. There's a lot of goodness in people, but they're not by any means wholly good. They're pretty bad. If you love them for being, you know, unalloyedly good, or, you know, only with defects that don't really matter, you don't love them, you love an illusion of them. And if you love an illusion of somebody but not them, you don't really love them. And so the whole trick to loving people is to love people despite the fact that they're awful. Because there's still good in them to love. So things like that, which is a real insight into how you deal with people. Because otherwise, you know, you're going to go through life tearing your hair out because real life is going to constantly challenge your illusion that people are great. People do bad things. Good people do bad things. There are some saints. Even some of the saints have done some pretty bad things, especially, you know, before the saintly period in their life. Even some saints have, you know, fallen and gotten back up again at times. Um, so, you know, in some sense, the saintly period of their life started after their, their last stumble. Um, but in, in any event, there are a few people who never, who, who barely ever do anything wrong to anybody. Um, but almost everybody else does some seriously bad things wrong. They, 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 they make serious mistakes. They, they actually betray trust they really, really shouldn't have. Or they are grossly selfish. Or all, all manner of things that really do make other people's lives rather meaningfully worse. Most of us hurt other people. It's really sad and it's really unfortunate, but we do. And so if you're not going to love somebody, if you find out they've done anything really wrong, basically there are two categories of people who you love, unless you're lucky enough to actually be living next to a saint, and those are, um, I'm sorry, there are two categories of people. Those you don't love anymore because you found out that they're bad, and those you still love because you haven't yet found out that they're bad. Your life is going to be miserable if you take this approach. If you give up, if you realize, okay, you know what? I need to figure out some way of loving people even though they are bad, because they're also good, in different ways, mind you, um, and about different things, etc. But, you know, they can receive love, and that is the important thing. This is very deeply liberating. This makes life make vastly more sense. It is way, way less stressful, because you don't have to go around life being terribly afraid of what you're going to learn around every corner about people. Because you know what? If you learn something terrible about a person, okay, you know what? You, you find out that somebody's been lying to you. That's really unfortunate. But you know what? If, if your entire relationship to them... And I'm not saying that, that all people can be accepted for all things, obviously. You know, I mean, if somebody's, you know, endangering your children or something, well, obviously you need to get the children to safety. Um, you know, so I'm not saying that, that, you know, all things, you know, or that things don't matter. But rather, you know, you find out that somebody, um, you know, ha has been lying to you in some significant way that is, you know, still survivable. Well, you know, that's not nothing, but at the same time, it's not like your entire worldview is going to be shattered and now you have to learn to love, you know, this person who, who you didn't be heretofore know. If you don't have that illusion that everybody's perfect, you can still have that love for the good part of them intact and you only have to readjust part of your relationship that has been damaged, not the entire thing. And living in that state of having to readjust your, you know, potentially having to readjust entire relationships is awful. It's, it's traumatizing. It's, it's incredibly stressful. Whereas if you learn to sort of let that go and be realistic about people, you actually will be much happier and you will love them and you'll actually be a hell of a lot less hurt. You'll, you'll be hurt in the appropriate amount when people hurt you and not wildly in excess of that because your world isn't shattering at that point. You're only receiving whatever injury you've received. So like there's an example of, you know, truths that help to make life intelligible to people. And you know, and that and that is understandable in a sort of secular level, but it's also one of the truths that Jesus was very big on harping on about, you know, loving people in spite of the fact that they are sinners. You know, that that Christian mantra about, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner. It's not just a, a, a virtue to do. It makes your life much much better. It makes life much less stressful. Um, and, and so things like that, you know, getting across those sorts of things, you know, essentially giving out the wisdom one has received in Christianity, is the approach I'm taking, because over time, it helps people, I think, and I think, you know, I'm not saying I've seen wild success with this or anything, 
Um, you know, still early days yet to a great degree. Um, but over time, this helps people to look at the world differently. It helps people to you know, let go of some of their fears. It helps pe you know, the world to make more sense. And the more the world makes sense, the more other true things within the world become believable. Um, so it's, to a great degree, it, it, um, it amounts to things like starting you know, from whatever end a person needs to start from, and not starting from whichever end is most convenient to us to start. And that, to a great degree, means hanging out, living with people, loving them, and seeing, you know, what are their needs, because their needs consist of, you know, the end they need to start from. So that's what I'm trying anyway, very, very deeply and perfectly, believe me. Um, but as I said, in, in real life, you know, online, much, much less so. Because... Um, because it has no particular point. There aren't the relationships, um, you know, with strangers online. So that's sort of where I am. Um, hope that was uh, of some value t uh, to people, either to, you know, recognize a common experience or, you know, get some hint of things you might be able to recognize if you're going off to try this yourself. And uh, until next time, may you hit everything you aim at. Welcome to Missing the Mark, where we look for meaning in strange places. I'm Christopher. Today I'm going to be talking about my experience in arguing with atheists, because I had referenced this in a previous video saying why I don't debate atheists, and I mentioned a big part of it is how I've done it a lot. Um, but one of the mistakes human beings are very prone to is we tend to assume that everybody is just like us. This is the downfall of a lot of political theories, by the way, but that, that's beside the point. Um, and, and the really funny thing about this, because it's obviously not true, we're obviously, you know, all fairly different, but, I mean, with, with great similarities, of course. But the thing is, we'll even do this about experience. And that's obviously silly, because we've all lived different lives, and so we're not going to all have the same experiences. And yet, it's a problem that I and others have, we kind of just assume unconsciously that everyone does. And so, in, you know, in this particular case, when I made reference to my long experience of debating atheists and how they sort of never come up with anything new, I was kind of taking it for granted that everyone knew what they do in fact come up with. And, you know, it, there's that mistake. So, for the benefit of, of those of you who have not done a tremendous amount of arguing with atheists, I, I have, I've never really done like a formal debate thing, you know, with moderators and timekeepers and whatnot, because that's a form of public entertainment. That doesn't help the, you know, the argument at hand. That, that's just there to make sure that the audience doesn't get bored, basically. Um, so I'm going to go over, you know, the basics of how these arguments tend to go. Um, for the benefit of those of you who haven't been in them all the time. Now, now this is primarily addressed to, to Christians. Um, you know, anyone on the theist side. Although theist just means non-atheist. I don't know. Anyway, point is, um, that's the intended audience here. I, I strongly doubt that an atheist would get anything out of this video. But, hey, you never know, whatever. Okay, so, um, generally speaking, th there's, there's one of two ways that these arguments te will tend to go. Uh, probably the more common, and usually often the first too, if a person goes for both, is they start out with unmeetable evidentiary standards. So like for example, they'll only accept as true something that shows up in peer-reviewed scientific papers. Uh, of course this is absolutely silly as a you know general criteria for acknowledging something as true. Um, I mean the easiest way, it, it, my friend Yves Kanan loves to um, use the principle of retortion, applying a principle to itself. And, you know, a lot of things just sort of immediately fail by that principle. Things that are universal. Non-universals this doesn't apply to because they often don't apply to, you know, they're not supposed to apply to themselves. But here, if you'll only accept things in scientific peer-reviewed papers, you could even do the very silly thing of, well, can you prove to me that this peer-reviewed scientific paper that you have was in fact a peer-reviewed scientific paper? Where is the peer-reviewed scientific paper stating that